Hi, it's Friday evening, June 28th, and it's a busy day out there in the Atlantic. We've got three systems to watch, two of them in rather uncommon areas for June. We've got a new tropical depression, tropical depression 2, and a tropical wave behind that, which may also develop over the ensuing days. And we have a tropical wave over the Western Caribbean, and that's where we're going to start briefly. This is the shortest term concern. This is the zoomed in satellite loop of this wave, which remains a open trough as far as we can tell not much in the way of a closed circulation here but there is a trough laying across the gulf of honduras in the northwest caribbean and this is all going to move across the yucatan peninsula and into the bay of campeche southern gulf of mexico as we talked about in previous videos there is an upper level trough over the gulf right now so you'll see some of this milky white feathery cirrus pushing into the wave axis from the west and that indicates the wind shear that is helping to push all the convection off to the eastern side of the wave axis, and there's also some dry air going on on this northwest side as well. So as this pushes into the southern Gulf of Mexico, we expect conditions to remain suboptimal. This could develop, but it might be at the last minute, and it probably doesn't have much time. It's going to pass over land, and then it's going to have limited time over the southern Gulf with water, and eventually this upper level trough that it's entangled with will start to erode and weaken and so that wind shear and dry air impacts will abate but it may not be in time for this to develop significantly before a second landfall in eastern mexico but we could see an organizing system that makes a run at tropical depression status prior to that but the main story with this will mostly be rain not only for eastern mexico but for the yucatan peninsula guatemala belize area as well as Honduras and Nicaragua over the next couple of days. This is the European model just showing that wave axis moving across. I'll just show you how that looks on this one model run. You can see that a broad circulation does eventually form at the last minute, but as we said, it's likely to run out of time to do anything beyond uh, perhaps getting an advisory from the National Hurricane Center as a tropical depression or weak tropical storm. If we go to the main view of the Atlantic now, we've got two waves to watch, and one is not a wave anymore. This is newly christened Tropical Depression 2, which has become organized enough for NHC to initiate advisories, and this is coming toward the Windward Islands over the next few days. It will be there sometime around Monday, and this is something to watch for residents of those areas. Here's the zoomed-in satellite loop of the disturbance that has been gradually organizing and it's been rather broad and elongated within the monsoon trough, and there's been a touch of easterly shear impacting the system. So if you kind of assess the low-level wind directions here, it is a little messy, but we've had southwesterly flow kind of flaring out and then loosely wrapping back in on the northern side. And so it's been a little elongated southwest to northeast here. But best we can tell, the circulation center is probably somewhere just to the east of the main burst of strong thunderstorms that you see there at the end of the loop. So it's not co-located with the thunderstorms and we don't have tight wrapping of banding or the wind field around that whole eastern side just yet. We have a microwave pass from SSMIS that kind of confirms this. These bright colors here indicate that big ball of convection on the west side. But then you'll see some of this banding in dark blue that's near the low levels in this microwave image. And that's kind of showing you that the, the surface circulation is kind of more on the eastern side of that deep convection. And so that easterly shear pushing that off towards the west is resulting in a system that is still realistically rather disorganized. It has now met the definition of a tropical depression, but nothing rapid in terms of quick intensification is yet occurring here. In order to get that, we would need to see tight convective banding wrapping symmetrically more all around the low level center. Right now, we only have unstructured convection on the west side with some deep updrafts. We do expect this to continue intensifying over the next few days now that it has formed, uh, but it's going to be a gradual, not rapid process until we get that inner core structure to start forming up. This is the GFS depiction of this on the mid-level relative humidity plot and mid-level wind plotted here. Sea level pressure contours in black, so you can see the weak circulation as of the current time on the model for TD2. But as this moves west, you see that the pressure number starts to lower. So this is a deepening, gradually intensifying system. And then in the final couple days, as it starts moving toward Barbados, you see that number really start to tank, indicating that in this model, the inner core has formed and this starts to intensify. And you can see that the moisture envelope is rather symmetric here, indicating that wind shear values are pretty low. And as it moves toward the Windward Islands, 
970 millibars, that's a hurricane strength system on this model. And you can see why this happens. If you look at the 200 millibar flow, we have an upper level ridge, which is imparting easterly flow aloft over a system that is moving, e moving westward due to easterly trade winds. So we have low level easterlies over the storm and upper level easterlies out of the same direction and at roughly the same speed. So this is a low shear situation. There's a little bit of easterly shear now, but that's supposed to relax and we'll have almost no vertical shear over the system. And so as long as an inner core structure does develop, this is going to intensify on approach to the islands. And it is forecast by the National Hurricane Center to be a hurricane on arrival, potentially getting winds up near 100 miles per hour by the time it crosses into the Caribbean. So the question now for the residents of the Lesser Antilles is what the reasonable worst case scenario is here in terms of this intensification. The NHC forecast is for a category one or two hurricane. There is an opportunity in some of these models for it to be approaching major hurricane status. These are some of the hurricane mesoscale dynamical models we have uh, from the National Weather Service. This is halves B showing winds well in excess of 100 or 115 miles per hour as it passes Barbados. And the halves A version of this model has the same thing going on, maybe just a tad weaker. But this is higher than the official forecast, and it represents kind of the ceiling case here. These models are quite aggressive right now. It doesn't mean it will be this strong, but the potential might be there if we get an inner core and an eye wall to develop quite early in this process. So it's really going to depend a lot on how this satellite structure changes over the next 24 hours. On those aggressive halves models that have a major hurricane in the Windward Islands, they develop a compact inner core as soon as 24 hours from now. So when we come back tomorrow and talk about this, how that has evolved will be very important in terms of how strong this will get during the ensuing couple of days before this arrives in the islands around Monday. So if we look at the GFS, we'll see that, again, that timing is kind of Monday morning here. And yes, there is a wave coming up behind it. And we are going to have to talk about that one, too. In this video, I won't be going into detail on it. Uh, we need to get TD2 kind of out of the way here before we start talking about the impacts of this one. But there might be two storms coming towards the Lesser Antilles over the next several days. And if we switch over to the west now and kind of look at uh, where the GFS has this go after it enters the Caribbean. Here it is on Monday morning, Monday afternoon rather. And it enters the Caribbean and it's a pretty strong hurricane at this point. Now, we talked about conditions being favorable on entry to the Caribbean. That is going to change at some point. So if we look at the GFS ensemble mean, as it enters the Caribbean again, upper level easterlies, and as it's being ushered by the low level easterly trade winds, this equates to low shear, so favorable for the storm. Now, as it goes farther west, you might see that there is a little bit of an upper level trough here. This is a tut, tut axis upper level trough that is imparting, you can see southwesterly flow over the Caribbean. It's light, but because there's strong easterly trade winds underneath, there is in fact a lot of westerly shear here. Now this tut is in the process of weakening early next week. And so it's possible that this ridge may be able to come in and weaken the tut. But what happens on a lot of the modeling right now is that there's a new infusion of upper level vorticity coming from an anticyclonic wave breaking event over the eastern US. You have a big area of high pressure over the southern US, and that is pushing this new upper level trough down into the tut area. And so you'll see this reinforcement of the tut such that by five days we have a renewed upper level trough, which really does keep the wind direction aloft out of the southwest over the northern and northwestern Caribbean. So if you have a storm moving into this, the shear can't help but increase. And so conditions are going to become less optimal for TD2 as it moves deeper into the Caribbean. We can see what this does on the model. As this starts coming west, you'll see that the sea level pressure starts to rise, meaning the storm is weakening a little bit. And then the other problem for the storm on this run is it, it runs right into Hispaniola. So th this island of Hispaniola right here is very, very topographically complex, very tall mountains and terrain. Any TC that runs into that tends to get shredded up pretty good. And so as this goes forward, the storm almost completely dissipates. It becomes a weak tropical storm after passing over Haiti as a strong hurricane. And then it runs into the mountains of Cuba and weakens even further. And you can see that the moisture signature is very asymmetric. It's all on the eastern side of the circulation due to that westerly shear pushing it that direction. And yes, again, I do see the second storm coming in behind here. 
That's a new development that we will spend more time in the coming days talking about, but for now we're going to focus on TD2 in this video. Now, as far as the track goes for this system, it is highly linked to the intensity, and there's a lot of complex interactions that make these two related, and especially for this system. This is a depiction of some of the uncertainty we're looking at with the GFS Ensemble. This is showing the various tracks from the model of where TD2 could go. Uh, and the coloring is the intensity, so anything yellow and orange here is kind of showing hurricane-like intensity in the model, but then when it's uh, green and blue, it's, it's only tropical depression or storm strength. So you can see that it does intensify as it enters the Caribbean, because we talked about conditions being favorable here in general. And one thing to note is that the latitude where it enters the Caribbean, that is probably dependent a little bit at least on how quickly the storm intensifies into a, a stronger hurricane. If that happens early, then we're likely to see it start to angle just a little bit more toward the north as it enters the Caribbean. If it stays a little weaker, it might ride a little lower down toward the south. That's usually what happens with these, and this will likely be no different. Now, as it comes west, though, you'll see that impact of the the wind shear, but also the land interaction that we just talked about. A lot of these colors go from orange and yellow to more blue and green, especially the members that track close to Jamaica, Hispaniola, and Cuba, so you can see that weakening happening on the model in general. But if the system struggled a little bit in the Eastern Caribbean originally, maybe not quite as strong as some of those strongest forecasts, then it might ride a little bit lower, miss some of the shear, and also miss some of the land mass, and maybe it would be a little stronger a little more consistently strong passing to the south of Jamaica and just moving mostly westward into the Western Caribbean. So that's kind of what we're dealing with here is the interaction not only with the, the environmental shear, but also with the land masses. And all of that will also be related to how quickly the storm intensifies on approach to the Caribbean in the first place. So the next couple of days are going to matter a lot for the future. And then there's still some uncertainty here, and we're talking about many days out. We're talking about five days for it to get into the Central Caribbean, and we're still not sure where it's going to be yet in relation to the landmass. This is the European Ensemble 500 millibar chart, and this is showing when the system is near or south of Hispaniola by midweek, you can kind of see how there's a big ridge over the southeastern U.S., which we kind of mentioned before, and then there's a little bit of a weakness in the ridge, and then here's the rest of the ridge off over the central Atlantic here. And this weakness, you know, will play a role as well. If the system is riding more toward the north in the Lesser Antilles, then it might feel this weakness a little more and move toward Hispaniola. Uh, but if it's farther south, it's going to keep going west for longer. And if it doesn't hit this weakness and move into the Greater Antilles, then it's probably going to turn toward the west again later on, just because we do have this big ridge over the southeastern U.S. So if it gets caught underneath that, it's just going to keep going generally west or west-northwestward. It would be difficult for it to make a sharp turn once it gets past this weakness here. But at this point, we are getting a little out over our skis, it's a little too early to start talking about what it's gonna do after it gets past the Central Caribbean. After that point, uncertainty is just really high at this time. Here's the National Hurricane Center five-day forecast. This is a fairly briskly moving system, moving west at 17 miles per hour right now, but you can see tropical storm in S's for the first couple of forecast points, and then by Sunday afternoon, it becomes a hurricane with winds of 75 miles per hour, and then it has winds approaching 100 miles per hour by the time it gets to the area of Barbados and the rest of the Windward Islands. And you can see that track at the moment is just south of Barbados, but that doesn't mean it, it will be. There is some uncertainty here, some wiggle room in where this crosses the islands. So exactly which island gets the eyewall if this is a hurricane with a strong inner ring of wind. That will depend a bit on the exact track. But in terms of overall wind risk, we do see quite an envelope here. Everything in this orange shade has at least a 50-50 chance of dangerous winds of tropical storm force or higher, 40 miles per hour or stronger. So you can see that corridor of wind risk there covers most of the Windward Islands and then even some risk in the Leeward Islands and the Greater Antilles as well. And there's also going to be rain. So you can see there's a corridor of heavy rain following the storm track. Again, will be related to, you know, exactly where it crosses the islands. will determine where some of the heaviest rains is, but a broad swath of potential flash flooding risk with anything that moves through uh, these islands. And again, 
the uncertainty does balloon in here. So the National Hurricane Center shows some weakening of the hurricane as it moves toward Jamaica on this particular forecast, but much will depend on what happens between now and then, whether it interacts with the topography here or not, and whether the wind shear is able to disrupt it. If we have a stronger storm here, very strong and a little larger, it might be better able to resist the upper level tut and erode it and uh, lower the wind shear values a little bit. And if it can stay south of the land masses, then we might be talking about a hurricane that can actually survive its trek through the Caribbean and be a threat to others later down the line. But if it's weaker entering the Caribbean and succumbs to the shear earlier, or if it moves right into the Lesser Antilles where there's complex terrain, then we might be talking about a storm that weakens a whole lot after it gets into the Caribbean. So there's a range of outcomes here, and we're just going to have to be a little patient on figuring out the details. Right now, it's all about the Windward Islands and some of the impacts that are likely there as we head through the weekend and into Monday. That's when we're expecting a hurricane to be rolling through. So everyone, please be prepared and stay safe as this storm rolls in. That's going to be it for this video. We'll talk more about this wave down the line. That's it for now. Thanks for watching.